Hey. Hi, everybody. It's lovely to be here in the Bay Area. Greetings to you if you're watching in Fremont and if you're watching in Sunnyvale or you're watching at home. I feel honored to be among you. And I love how multicultural this area is, and particularly this church. Um, I have quite a multicultural family background. Uh, I'll see if you can guess uh, all my background. So my mother was born in India. My father was born in Malaysia. My father's father was born in Sri Lanka. And any guesses on my mother's father? Well, I'm going to show you a picture of him. You ready? Have a look up here. And uh, now you're going, which one? Which one is my grandfather? It's actually the guy with the pith helmet on. Uh, he is Irish. Did you guess that? Looking at me, can you, can you see the Irish? There is, there's a bit of Irish. And he was an incredible shot with a rifle. This is not a trophy killing. He's not a sports hunter. He was the guy they called in if there was a man-eating tiger marauding through the village. And uh, he would help them and shoot the tiger so that the villagers wouldn't get eaten, which I think is a, a really nice thing to do if uh, you have that ability. He was called, well, he volunteered for the Indian Army and ended up serving, fighting against the Nazis in North Africa, in a place called El Alamein. And he was providing covering fire for his troops, and he managed to get all the guys out, but no one provided covering fire for him. So he died in the desert. And he was presented with the Military Cross, which is the second highest military award you can get in the British Army, and the Indian Army of that time. And the problem was, my mother had an Irish dad and an Indian mum. And in those days, a multiracial marriage was really unusual. And so the kids were given a horrible, stigmatic name. They were called half-caste, and that's a really offensive term. And, but that's what they had to live with. And it meant the kids weren't welcomed in the Indian family, and they weren't welcome in the Irish family. So guess what they did? They put the three girls into three separate orphanages in India. And I know what you're thinking. You're going, hold on, they've, they've got a mum. Why are kids who have parents living in an orphanage? Well, it turns out, uh, this is another part of my, my work, actually. There's about 5.1 million children around the world who are living in orphanages. And almost all of them have living mums and dads, and many have living grandparents and aunties and uncles. They're not in orphanages because they're orphans. They're often in orphanages because they're poor. And uh, I'm, I'm on a kind of global campaign to try and persuade governments and sometimes churches that we don't need orphanages. What we need is family support. So children go back and live with their mums and dads. And if they can't live with their mums and dads, uh, well, let's find them kinship carers, you know, aunties and uncles. And if we can't find them, then let's get local fostering and adoption going. And actually, that's why I'm in the Bay Area at the moment. I'm here with Foster the City, and uh, you're going to be hearing a lot about them throughout our time together. And at the end of the service, we'd love you to come and chat uh, with us on the Foster the City uh, area. Now, my mum grows up in India in an orphanage, and then a grand aunt hears about these three girls. And she's in England, in Brighton. And so she manages to come out to India, collect the girls, and take them to England and kind of provide a, almost like, a, I guess, a foster home for them. And my mum, when she was about 16 years old, decides she wants to give something back to society. So she trains to become a nurse. Now, brown nurses in white Britain weren't treated well back then. Some of the patients wouldn't let my mother touch them. And they'd say, we don't want a brown nurse, we'd like a white nurse, please. Maybe they thought the brown was going to rub off on them. <laughs> My mum got bananas thrown at her in the street. And racist people would say, why don't you go black home to where you came from? Aren't racists clever with their words? But my mum, she was amazing. She started a one-woman resistance campaign against the xenophobia. Every Friday night, She'd open up her home, she'd cook up a massive vat of curry and rice, and anyone who felt like they didn't fit in found welcome at my mother's table. She had this little oasis, a little sanctuary. My mum decided to fight hostility with hospitality. 
And that's what I want to talk to you about today. I believe that's our calling. If you're a follower of Jesus right now, you're a follower of the Prince of Peace. Our job is not to inflame the culture war and fight one group against another. Our job is to offer an oasis, a taste of the coming kingdom of God through hospitality. And you're going to see how that gets worked out as we go through the scriptures. Are we making friends? Yes, yeah, Sunnyvale, Fremont, are we making friends? I'm about to show you a picture that could cause a bit of division. It's not an offensive picture. It just causes people to have a bit of a debate. And I'm going to show it on the screen. And then wherever you are, wherever you're watching this, I want you to find someone that you can talk to. Could be a neighbor. Could be someone behind you or in front of you. And I want you to just answer one simple question. What color is the dress? Go on, have a chat. What color is the dress? All right, I'm going to take your picture while you're working this out because I'm addicted to social media. Yes, I'm on Instagram. So are you. Okay, let's hear it out. Uh, Hands up wherever you are. Uh, If you see white and gold. Yes. Okay, I don't know how to break this to you, but you might be Episcopal or Anglican. (laughs) Because they see like white dresses and gold crowns all over the shop. How about anyone see blue and black? Yes. Okay, you might be like Baptists. Because Baptists, they see the blue of water in all sorts of places. Now, I'm only teasing. But there's something weird going on, isn't there? That you could be sat next to someone. You know, it could be your family, your friend. And you're looking at the same picture, but you're seeing something different. What's going on? I, I like my own space. Um, and, and I had to go to the opticians recently. And the opticians is not a place where you get your own space. I could tell what my optician had had for lunch without her telling me. <laughs> so I, I got my phone out and showed her this picture just to get a bit of distance between me and her garlic-inspired lunch. And, um, and she said that the reason that you and I might see different things in that picture is because of the distribution of rods and cones on the back of your retina. And your brain, therefore, processes color differently. I don't know if that's true or not. It just gave me some space to breathe in an (laughs) difficult place. But I find that a really interesting little metaphor of the Christian faith. You could be sat next to someone on the bus tomorrow, or at work, or at school, or at college, and you're looking at world events. Maybe the, you know, the new story about Prince Harry falling out with his brother, Prince William. Or maybe the, the famine that's going on in Afghanistan right now. Or the fact that girls can't go to school or university. Uh, or it might be something local that's happening. You're looking at global events. And because of something about you, because of your Christian faith, you see something different to other people. You see, the gospel message... The person and work of Jesus has rebooted your brain and your heart and your will. And so now, even though you're sat next to someone, you're working with them, you might even be sharing a house with them, you see something different. Does that that make sense? In, In the Bible, in Colossians, it talks about gaining the mind of Christ. That means you see the world as Jesus sees it. And that means everything's different doesn't just mean Sunday mornings or small group or, or your quiet time. Everything is different. Career, um, world politics, money, relationships. Everything's different now because the gospel is rebooting your brain thanks to the power of the Holy Spirit. We're going to test it out, okay? I'm going to show you another picture. And this picture, again, you don't need a trigger alert. I'm going to tell you what most people see when they see this picture And then I'm going to ask you the theological question. What does God see when he looks at this picture? That's what we're going to do. We're going to do it on all the campuses, so be ready and be ready at home as well. Okay, here's the picture. This is Robert. It's not his real name. It's because Robert is in the foster care system. Robert, when this picture was taken, was five years old. And he had something pretty traumatic happen to him at home that meant his mum and dad can't bring him up anymore. And he didn't have any aunties or uncles or grandparents who could care for him. So he came into the foster care system. And his foster carers love him to bits. 
but they don't feel able to adopt him, and so Robert is available for someone else to adopt. And in England, when you've been approved to be a, an adopter, you get access to a special website. It used to be called Be My Parents. And you get to see Robert's face, and you get to read a little bit of his bio. Now, the problem is everyone and thousands of people had clicked onto Robert to read his bio. Everyone that read Robert's bio decided he wasn't for them. Let me tell you some of the reasons why. Number one, Robert is five years old. Now, for a lot of people coming to adoption, adoption is about an answer to the problem of fertility. In England, it's about 70%. Now, I don't think we as churches and communities often do a good job of supporting people that are wrestling with the pain of infertility. Sometimes coming to church can be the hardest place. Sometimes we, well-meaningly, will nudge a couple and say, hey, when are you guys going to get started? And we don't know the secret pain that's going on behind closed doors. So we need to cut that out and start helping people rather than pressurizing people more. But when fertility is your motivator for adoption, guess what kind of child you want to adopt. You don't want a five-year-old boy. You want a baby. Now hear this. Babies are amazing. Yeah. right? If you want proof of the existence of God, you know, maybe you're wavering, just spend a bit of time in the presence of a baby. And I don't know what it is, but for me, it's baby fingernails. right? Baby fingernails are proof of the existence of God. If you're having a big debate with an atheist friend, just present a baby to them, and it will reboot them. They'll go, this is just too amazing. This child is so gorgeous. It can't just be the consequence of blind chance. This child is a gift. Sometimes that works. It works for me. So no one's denying babies are amazing. But the problem is we've got our brains mixed up about what adoption is for. I often tell people adoption is not about finding children for families. It's about finding families for children. And then the whole thing gets flipped around. It's not about us. It's about them. Once you start understanding that adoption is about finding families for children, it means lots of us could step up. We could be the best parents that some of these children need in their lives. You might be thinking, I don't need any extra children in my life, but maybe a child needs you in their life. Does that make sense? We could step up. We might be single and doing that. We might have no kids. Uh, we might be married with kids. Could we add to our family through adoption? Think about this. I don't know if you've reflected on this, but if you are a follower of Jesus today, you are an adopted person. Did you know that? Every time you say the Lord's Prayer, what's the first two words of the Lord's Prayer? Do you know it? Our Father. Do you know what? You do not have the birthright to call God your Father. The only person in the universe that has the birthright to call God Father is Jesus. He's the eternal Son of God. You and I, that's not us. We only have the right to call God our Father because we've been adopted. Now, when God adopted you, was he bored? Was he lonely? Was there something missing in him? Was he infertile? God did not adopt you because he needed it. God adopted you because you needed it. God stepped up and became the heavenly father that you and I needed him to be for us. That's the grace of God. And so a Christian vision of adoption doesn't put me at the center. It puts the needs of children at the center. You hear me? So the first reason that, that Robert's been waiting is he's too old. Second reason. Robert's teacher loves him to bits, but she wants to be really honest so that a prospective adopter gets a full picture. We don't want to hoodwink anyone into this. And so Robert has speech delay. And so the teacher says, Robert's a great kid. We love having him in our class. But because of his speech delay, sometimes Robert gets frustrated. And that works its way out as difficult to manage behavior. That phrase, difficult to manage behavior, is enough to write off Robert's chances of being adopted. 
They go, hey, if he's got difficult to manage behavior at five, what's he going to be like at 15? You see how the logic goes? And so Robert gets labeled a problem child, someone else's problem, unadoptable, and every single person that's looked at his profile has clicked on. Not for me, not for me, not for me. Now, are you ready for the theological question? Let's have that picture back up again. And here's what I want to ask you. What does God see when he looks at Robert? I'm looking for three things. Fremont, Sunnyvale, people at home, you can play too. Three things. I call this speed theology, okay? It's a bit like speed dating because you're going to chat to someone else. Maybe you don't know them. Hopefully it's less embarrassing than speed dating. And um, just come up with three things you think God sees when he looks at Robert. And if you're new to faith or exploring it, we've been singing a lot about the grace of God. So can you imagine what the God we've been singing to might see when he looks at Robert? Have a go and we'll talk again in a minute, okay? Have a chat. Go for it. You can talk louder. It's church. I'm going to try another shot of the picture for my Insta. Because I've already answered this question. Nice. Looking good. You've been so quiet. What happened, church? Okay, your time's up. Uh, here are some of the answers that I hear. When God looks at Robert, he sees someone of intrinsic value, dignity, and worth. Because of Psalm 139. Do you remember that one? He is fearfully and wonderfully made. That's true of everybody, isn't it? My daughter has that verse underneath her mirror. I want her to know that no matter what the world says about her or what the teenage YouTubers are telling her about her, she has intrinsic value, dignity, and worth. And she hasn't got to live up to anyone else's expectations because God already sees her as wonderful. Is that right? I want my teenage boys to know that as well as my teenage girls, but she's the one with the biblical kind of vision at the moment, which is great. So Robert is fearfully and wonderfully made. Oh, how is Robert ever going to know that when all he's had is rejection after rejection after rejection? He is not, you might go and preach a sermon at him, maybe drop a, a, a kind of little tract at him or, or tell him to watch the chosen TV series, all great things. But until someone shows him the love of God practically, I wonder if he's going to be able to hear it. You hear what I'm saying? Second thing I hear sometimes is that God loves Robert. Is that, did you come up with that one? What's the most famous Bible verse in the world? John 3, 16. You know, you see it at basketball games. Do you remember the guy, the guy that has John on his T-shirt, the other guy's got three on his T-shirt, and the other guy's got a colon. The colon's the cool guy, right? And then sometimes there's two guys, one and six. Because they want the world to know this most famous verse in the Bible, John 3, 16. You remember how it goes? For God so loves middle-class white people from normal families. <laughs> that's not how the verse goes. But that's how we live sometimes. Those are the people that God loves, the normal people. But that is not how the verse goes. For God so loved the world. Every single person on this planet right now is loved by God. That's true whether you're rich or poor, black or white, gay or straight, Hindu or Muslim, atheist or Christian. God loves the world. Is that right? God has nothing. It's just got incredible love for every single human being. Everybody you ever meet on the bus, at work, you know, in the carpool, God loves the world. It doesn't mean that the world has responded in love towards God, but God is full of love for the world. That has complications and implications. I used to live in Albania. In Albania, a mate of mine had a sign outside his front door in Albania. It said, love me, love my dog. It was a package deal, right? You couldn't say, I love you, but I hate your dog. You can say, I love your dog, but I hate you. It was both together. 
The same is true for the Christian faith. If you love God, which is the first commandment, isn't it? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. What was the second? Love your neighbor as yourself. It's a package deal. You can't love God and ignore your neighbor. If you love God, you will love your neighbor. Who is your neighbor? It's anyone that you have the opportunity to serve and show kindness to. And, and every child in the foster care system in the Bay Area is a neighbor to us. Are you hearing me? Yeah. All right, third thing people sometimes say. What does God see when he looks at Robert? Some people say God sees the image of himself. Have you heard that idea that you are made in the image of God and you are and all your friends and family and all your enemies and Robert, all made in the image of God? Now, look, afterwards, when this service is finished and the band have done their job and you've prayed and we've, we've kind of finished our time together in this room, we're going next door to drink coffee and buy books, okay? <laughs> the buy books bit is optional. But if you want to buy books, great, I'll be out there. And uh, if you want to, I'll show you a picture of my family. And, and I, I've, I've got them on my phone. Now, I, I know we're in a, in a very nice area. The area is lovely. I love it to bits. And uh, if I showed you a picture of my family, it's unlikely but possible that your face might get screwed up in disgust at meeting my children and my wife. Or even worse, imagine you were to spit on a picture of my family on my phone. Now, at one level, I'm okay. Because, friends, this is a Samsung Galaxy S22 Ultra. <laughs> and that has brilliant water resistance. Okay? So your spit isn't going to get anywhere near my pictures. But you've had a lot of weird rain recently, so maybe you somehow got toxic saliva. And it gets inside my phone. Fries my phone. Well, I'm a Google fanboy. I'm hearing you. Right. H- hands up if you think Google phones are better than iPhones. Hey. Come on. I'm sowing division, aren't I? I apologize. <laughs> but sometimes you've just got to speak truth. Right. If you work for Google, come and see me. I'm your biggest fanboy. <laughs> anyway, I am a Google fanboy, and all of my photos are backed up in high res in the Google Cloud. Thank you very much, Google, for free. Stupid iCloud, cost you a lot of money. (laughs) So your toxic saliva cannot hurt my photos. But symbolically, you spit on a picture of my family. If we were friends before, we are not friends anymore, are we? What you do to the image is an indicator of how you feel about the one being imaged. Does that make sense? So if everybody on the planet is made in the image of God, what you do to another person is an indicator of how you feel about God. That's why the two greatest commandments are linked. You show your love for God, not just by singing and praying, but by caring for the poor, by welcoming the stranger, by fighting racism and injustice, feeding the hungry, because the person you're serving is made in the image of God. Do you hear that? Okay, there's one last thing that you should see when you look at a picture of Robert. And we're going to need the Bible for that. We've been doing Bible already, but I want to take you on a little journey that ties most closely with this excellent new series you've got called Hearing God for Normal People. We're going to look at Luke chapter 24. It's the last chapter of Luke's gospel. And the most important event in human history has taken place. Jesus Christ has died for the sins of the world and has been risen and raised to life. If we were a Pentecostal church right now, you'd be saying like, amen or hallelujah, right? Uh, Let me just rewind a little bit, okay? (laughs) Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has died for the sins of the world and has been raised from the dead victorious. Good. That's the right response. What happens in this story is the wrong response. Let me talk you through it. Luke 24, verse 13. Now, that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But 
They were kept from recognizing him. How cool is that? Jesus turns up incognito, in disguise, like those mystery shoppers. You know, like when, um, I don't know, Steve Jobs turns up in an Apple store with a, with a, a kind of hat on so you can't tell who he is. Or, you know, um, uh, who would he do? Richard Branson would do that. He'd travel on his own airline in disguise, just seeing how people would treat him. Jesus turns up as a stranger to these two people. Where are they going? They are leaving Jerusalem because they've seen Jesus die on the cross and they are brokenhearted and disappointed. They haven't realized that the most important event in history has taken place, that Jesus has been risen from the dead. Man, you forget quick. So you now know more than they know. This is like a comedy sketch, like a French farce. You know it's Jesus, they don't know it's Jesus. So listen into the conversation. Jesus asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? Actually, Jesus is the only one in Jerusalem that does know what has happened, right? He died, conquered death, defeated all the demons, forgave our sins, and has been risen from the dead. But they don't know that. They don't understand it. One of them... Um, Sorry, what things, says Jesus. Don't you love it? Jesus just like plays along, doesn't he? He should be going, do you know who I am? But instead, he says, what things? About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they'd seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. I don't know about you, but most of the things I've got wrong in my life have happened because I didn't listen to women. (laughs) These guys, they should know that Jesus is risen from the dead because the women told them, but they don't believe him. For too long, the church has been getting a lot of things wrong because we haven't been listening to women. And I apologize on behalf of loads of stupid men who have silenced (laughs) women. The women knew it. They saw him. They were the first witnesses to the resurrection. It's another reason why you know the resurrection stories are true. If you were making it up, right, you wouldn't have had women as your witnesses because in the ancient world, women weren't trusted. So it's true. It's historically true. It's beautiful. And then Jesus kind of loses it a little bit with them. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. That Jesus isn't always meek and mild. Sometimes he has to speak truth, like I did about Google, you know. But (laughs) did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Another reason the church often gets it wrong is that we don't listen to the Bible. Jesus opens it up, not just the New Testament, the nice bits, the bits you put on fridge magnets, but the whole of it. He starts with Moses. That starts the book of Genesis. All the way through, he shows how the whole Bible was pointing to him. And then, then something exciting happens. This is where it gets really fun for me. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus, they still don't know who he is, continued on as if he was going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. When did they know it was Jesus? It was when they invited him to share food around their table. If you want to hear from God, a really easy way, although it will be costly, is to invite people that don't normally get invited to share food with you, to break bread with you. Jesus hides himself 
in the vulnerable. You probably know the most scary parable in the Bible is Matthew chapter 25. Do you remember he asked people, I was hungry, I was thirsty, I was a stranger. And two groups, one group welcomed him in, another group didn't welcome him in. And Jesus said, whatever you did for the least of these, you did for me. Every day we have opportunities to show our love for God by showing our love for the neighbor. Because when we serve our neighbor, the stranger, the hungry, the thirsty, the naked, the the sick, we are serving him. Whatever we do for the least of these, we do for him. It's around their dining table, the kitchen table, that the real spirituality breaks out and their eyes are open. In my house, our kitchen table is probably our most valuable piece of furniture. Not because of what it's made of. It's a a, a bit of uh, hardboard with some aluminium poles bolted on. It's probably worth a few pounds. But because of the relationships that are made around it. That's why it's valuable. I think of one boy. He turned up at our door and uh, he had bandages on his arms and scars on his face. And he'd just come straight from the emergency room. Someone had attacked him. And it wasn't safe for him to live at home anymore. He had a big pink suitcase with all his belongings. It wasn't his. It was loaned to him by a social worker. The social worker says her goodbyes. And then this lad is there in my lounge. And I'm trying to make small talk. I'm trying to you know, just chat about the weather or school or sports or something. And I can't get anywhere. And then my boys turned up. They're my oldest kids. They were aged 13 and 12, and they used a therapeutic tool that I wasn't aware of. It's called an Xbox. (laughs) And they challenged this lad to a game of FIFA, which is a soccer game. Now, soccer is like American football for (laughs) grown-ups. Because we don't need to wear, like, protective clothing when we play, right? (laughs) And, and, you know, rugby's another level, but anyway... They challenge him to a game of soccer. And my boys, I don't know what I did wrong in their spiritual formation. They support Arsenal. And this lad was an Arsenal fan. So they said, okay, you be Arsenal and we'll be Manchester United. And uh, somehow Arsenal was beating Manchester United 5-0. But there was a proud dad moment when I could hear the words coming out of my boys' mouths. Good shot, mate. Well done. You're really good at this. Oh, thanks for playing with us. They were just pouring love and grace into this little boy's life. He'd come straight from the emergency room. He was all, you know, huddled up and and, and angry and, and worried and scared and every muscle was clenched. And then often my boys just encouraged him. He begins to chill out and relax a little bit, stand a bit taller. And then it's dinner time. And dinner times when all the family gather around our table and the foster kids often get to meet the the rest of the family for the first time. And I'm I'm in charge of moving food from the the kitchen area to the dining table. And we're having sausages that night and and we take 25 sausages on a tray and we bring it over here and I place it down. Now somehow in this movement from here to here, 20 of the sausages go from this tray onto this new boy's plate. It's like he did some incredible kind of karate move, and bang, all they were on his plate. Now, I don't know about you, but I have two parts of my brain. Do do you? I've got the part of the brain that goes to church, reads the Bible, and the Holy Spirit's working on. And then I've got the other part that isn't being worked on at all. And that part of my brain is really angry. Right? And in my head, I'm having this very loud conversation. How dare you? You're a guest in my house. You've been here for like 50 minutes, and you've already swiped all the food. Like, do the maths. You're like, you can't have 10, and the rest of us, seven of us, can have five. I mean, particularly me, I'm going to be very down on my sausage quota. This is not right. <laughs> then there's my Christian part of the brain that the Holy Spirit's working on, that the Bible's working on, and, and I'm beginning to get the mind of Christ. And that's saying, hang on, hang on, Chris, calm down. Don't react, respond. Okay, okay. They said, don't forget that phrase your friend taught you. Be curious, not furious. There's always a story behind someone's behavior. Don't write someone off because they're doing something you don't like. Listen, 
Find out. Make some space for them to tell you their story before you've written off what they've done. That's really good leadership for anybody. Definitely for foster parents. And I began to wonder, what could have happened in this boy's life that he sees food and he needs to grab it? You hearing me? There had been food insecurity in his house. No one had been feeding him. He had to look after himself. And so there was a kind of gut instinct. See food, grab food. It made sense. Luckily, by the grace of God, the Christian part of my brain won the day. And that's the nice, kind words that came out of my mouth that day. And we calmed things down. Sausages were equally and righteously redistributed. (laughs) And all was well in the world. But friends, that boy... He was, a, he was a great lad. He had terrible things happen to him. The, the, the scar on his face and the burn on his arm, it was his own mother. I thought someone had used a knife on him, but she'd used her fingernails on him. And she'd poured a, poured a boiling kettle of water on his arm. She had trauma in her life. It, it's not a blame game we're talking about here, but this lad needed love in his life, didn't he? The person that was supposed to care for him actually abused him. That's so painful. A few months later, he'd he'd moved on to another family by then. We were his emergency carers. We got a call from his school. And they said, oh, Mr. Kandai, we we just thought we'd let you know. We we did a kind of end of year review with with your lad. And uh, we asked him what the highlight of his year. And I'm going, hang on. Like, how could you ask him that question? He had a terrible year. He was living with his mum. She abused him. And now he's in a foster home. How could you ask him that? He said, well, we just wanted you to know that, that he said living with you guys, the Kandias, was the highlight of his year. And I'm going, hang on, I live with me and I don't think it's that good. <laughs> we just try to show him a normal bit of kindness. That, that's what every child should expect. It shouldn't be weird. That should be a highlight. That should be normal. You might not think you've got much to give, but for some of these kids, what little you have would make such a big impact. You could be the best parent they've known. Yeah. Kindness, stability, reliability, compassion, all the things that should be normal in a child's life. You could be the people that provided that. In a moment, I'm going to lead a little prayer. And the prayer is, I guess, in two directions. The first direction is, is to say, okay, do you know today that you have been welcomed into God's family? Do you know that? That the Son of God died for your sins and rose from the dead to forgive us and help us become adopted into the family of God. And God is the best father you could ever dream of that loves you unconditionally because you're fearfully and wonderfully made. And he sees potential and hope in you. Do you know that? Is that in your DNA? Is it in your heart? Do you know the grace of God? If you don't, and this is a visit for you in the church, well, today you could even begin that journey back into the embrace of God. God is stood there with his arms open wide, welcoming us home. Love to offer that to you at beginning point today. Or are there people that God might be sending you to that need welcome from you? For you to share hospitality, it could be an estranged family member. It could be a neighbor. It could be a work colleague. Or it could be a foster child. I'm going to give you a little bit of space to think that through before we pray so you've made an informed decision about what you want to say to God. And to give you that space, I'm going to show you one of my favorite videos. It was a, a, um, a flash mob. Do you remember those? They were a thing back in the day. And uh, it's a surprise welcome that people flying into Heathrow Airport, which is my local airport, this is what happens one day when a flash mob turns up. Have a look. See if you like it.
We were born to be welcomed into the family of God and then to become welcomers of others. That's where our joy, our vive of life comes from. It's from being caught up in that love God has for you and for the world. After this service, I'm, I'm going to be out there chatting to people, fostering the city are there. And if you want to make a step to find out more about foster care or if you think it's not for you right now, but you might want to support another fostering family. They'd love to hear from you. But we're going to take a moment just to pray and to talk about the welcome of God. So if you're able to stand, if you're watching on uh, Fremont or Sunnyvale, stand too. And uh, let's pray together if that's okay. You may want to put your hands out as a sign of openness to God. Our first prayer is for those who know they need to feel the welcome of God. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that your word tells us you are stood with your arms open wide, ready to welcome us home. Whatever we've done, however far we've gone, however uh, unworthy we feel, Lord, thank you that your grace is enough to welcome us home, to forgive us our sins, to adopt us into your family. Lord, we thank you that Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world and was risen from the dead, victorious. Lord, we, we want to receive your welcome. Welcome us home. We want to be your children. We don't deserve it. There's nothing we can do to make us earn this. But we thank you that you give it to us anyway. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And secondly, Lord, we, we ask that you would open our eyes, that we would see people as you see them, that they are full of dignity and worth. They're valuable. They're made in your image, that our love for you is expressed by loving our neighbors. Lord, send us to those people around us that need us. Lord, we pray for family members that are far from us and maybe even far from you. Lord, we pray for colleagues at work or neighbors in our street Lord, give us grace that we would go and rebuild these bridges. Welcome them. And Lord, we do pray for every child in foster care in the Bay Area, everyone precious to you, everyone full of potential. Lord, let none of these children be written off 
as someone else's problem. Lord, thank you that you love them. And therefore, we are called to love them too. Give us grace to reach out to them in the power of the Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.